coming to getting the uh, the new new arena built, and also he's got some big event tomorrow night that he's going to be honored at. So maybe we can ask him about that. Okay, uh, yeah, why don't you? Ask and I don't know. I'm not sure if he wants to talk about the whole gay thing. No, 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 no. I, in fact, when he called me today, he uh, said he'd rather not talk about. No, no. He just he just uh, asked. He said, you know, did you want to talk about anything personal? I said, no. You know what? I said, only if he wants to. If he wants to, if he it's wants fine. to, fine. Yeah. I said, because I got other. Business type stuff. To yeah, talk about. I, I think that's more interesting. All right. You know, I mean, if he wants to talk about it, it's fine. Whatever he feels like. Yeah, yeah exactly. Just um, get out of the water. Good, good sir. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it was funny. I was supposed to get some uh, cash out, and my wife, she sends, she sends a check that should have been sent out next week early. So of course they cash it. So now we're nine hundred dollars overdrawn. I go, Colette. I said, <laughs> you know, I mean, the bank will cover it. Like, yeah, but come on, it's me. Yeah. yeah. I hate that when that happens. Uh, me too. I, you, 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 you. God, it's just one of my source sore me things. Too. That's why I like to handle the finances, you know. But she insists on paying the bills, so I guess it's the first time this has happened. So it's not that big a deal. Oh, it's the first time. Yeah, it's not that big a deal. All right, here we go. <laughs> Welcome. You're listening to Sports Econ 101. This is the show where we discuss sports topics. From a business perspective, I'm your host, Edward Brown, along with my co-host, Bruce McGowan, longtime sports radio personality. Now, today's show is going to be extra, extra special. Not just special, <laughs> not extra special, but extra, extra special. That's right. Because of our guest, who's going to be coming on in the second segment. Yeah, we've got one of the uh, leading uh, executives in the National Basketball Association, the guy who is the team president of the Golden State Warriors, the defending NBA champions, Rick Welts. And it's an interesting story. I've known Rick off and on since 1979. Oh, wow. So our association is kind of loose. We don't we don't know each other super well. But I he actually credentialed me for the NBA Finals back in 1979 when I was working in Portland, and he was the PR director of the Seattle SuperSonics. How that's, about that? That's awesome. In fact, yeah. wasn't 79? That was like a famous year, wasn't it? Uh, when uh, Magic Johnson and Larry Bird came out? Uh, they came out. They, they were actually drafted. Uh, for the 1979-80 season, yeah. Yeah. And so it was after the 79, 78-79 season. Yeah, I kept hearing that they, they saved basketball. Well, you know, in some respects, they, they changed basketball. I don't know if they saved it, but they certainly changed it. <laughs> All right. At each commercial break, we're going to be asking a sports trivia question. We're giving away vacations uh, to the first email with the correct answer. Um, and the vacation's free. Uh, the only request is a $100 cleaning fee to cover the housekeeping expenses. And where is the vacation taking It place? is at Lighthouse Resort and Marina, yeah. located about one hour northeast of San Francisco. Today's trivia theme is going to be interesting. It's going to be odd sports facts. Oh, I like that. That'll be kind of fun. So when uh, we come back, we're going to have Rick Welts on, and I want to ask him a few questions about, you know, main factors to the Warriors' success and, you know, drafting and Curry's humility and comments on the new stadium um, and by the way you know I was going to ask them also because I'm not sure how this fits in the staff at Oracle is extremely great <laughs> I don't know if that's a word. far cry from I, and I don't like I don't like get Rick into talking about the old uh, you know yeah. front office because it wasn't a very good one but boy they are a they, much they're, better they're front really office good. than okay. the old one yeah. stay with us you're listening, listening to Sports Econ 101 and we're going to be right back Maybe we should just call his office and they'll pass yes, Well, he said uh, he said he will call us. Oh, so okay. Gonna, cool. I'd rather. We can just, Sounds just like a plan, Stan. Yeah, my my daughter lost the little the little thing that goes around this. I don't know how she did that. It's in the house how somewhere. How did it come off? Oh, she oh, she took it off. Uh, she doesn't like it. So she takes. Just, just go online and get one of the new get pretty cheap. Yeah, she just likes to take things off. <laughs> you know how daughters are. Oh yeah. Like to do that. Yeah, Sarah used to. She, one time she took Eva's credit card and texted Isn't that great? Like it. That's what it looked like oh, today. Like Hawk Bill. She put it into the old DVD player in the oh. car. Good guy. This is on a mission. <laughs> He's got to get that treat from John Shaw and Melissa Bradley Real Estate. First, you got to step off the steps. <laughs>
Gus. Good job, Gus. Alright. That's our morning ritual here in Fairfax. Look at that one going. That's cute. I put that on Facebook today. Let's see if we get a kick out of it. Oh, yeah. Is that where you sit? Yeah, that's, that's part of here. That's a great view. Yeah, no, it's not bad. I thought you said that the view was well, kind of, we're kind of up high. Yeah, that's a great view. Yeah. But you know, you can you can see everything. Do you, know, do you know how much you saved by not having to pay for tickets? You know, I, I never thought about that. Oh. But I, I've probably been to about 5,000 games for free. So, you know, you figure that's a lot of money. I mean, those tickets right there have got to be at least. What, yeah, we, uh, we're, in, we're in an old section where we have our own, we have a desk, we have chairs, we got computers, we got TVs, we got, you know. But I mean, kind of close to where that would be, that would take it to be at least. Oh, yeah, days. at least uh, 175 dollars. Do you think Rick will call us on time? Do you think he's going to be late? No, no. Um, this, this guy, uh, what's his name? Uh, Raven Renner? Ray. Yeah. Ray. He uh, Ray gets on the phone. And he goes, "Is this is this Bruce McGowan?" Yeah. <laughs> he said, "No." And I, but I'm Edward Brown. I had a feeling it was, you know, which is already here. So, yeah. well, listen, remember Bruce Willie Hall? I said, "Yeah, yeah, that's right." He goes, "Who are you?" <laughs> oh, um, he's a character. I should have just said, "I'm the janitor." <laughs> he's a funny guy. He was, he was very nice. Yeah, no, he's a good. He's a, he's a crack up. And I let him know, you know, again, I always tell these guys, I said, we're not Jerry Springer, we're very nice people. We are nice people. We treat our people yeah. like coming on our show. Absolutely. And, and uh, you know, I mean, Come on, the way I want to do, I mean, I want, I want to do good radio, you know, but you can be nice and do good radio. Yeah, right? of course and then, you can. And then people want to come back. And you're such a nice guy. Yeah. Is that your cat, too? Yeah, cat and dog. Do they get along? Oh, they get along great. I bet the cat rules. Cat and wolves. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they are. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're a couple and, of buddies. And the, and the cat licks, licks uh, him where, where he needs to be cleaned. <laughs> how, how, how old is that? Uh, the cat, the dog is 18, the cat is a year old. Oh, that's all? Yeah. Gus is getting all mad at the cat there, as you can see. It's like the cat is taking a little too close liberties with Gus. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about this. Mama, mama and daughter. Isn't that sweet? Yeah, I know she's getting to be a big kid. Big girl. She is a big girl. She's a big girl. Yeah, she was just like, I mean, she's here, she's like a young woman. Whereas, yeah, she's about five foot tall now. Yeah, but I mean, just when she came in, the one woman that wears upstairs and all yeah. that. Uh, you know, a couple years ago, yeah. 2013. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing how much they changed in Oh, yeah. Three or four years, they just. Well, Sarah just got accepted to a program for the summer in Washington. Nice. Okay, so I don't know if I'll politics or whatever. Just don't let them overrule you, you know. <laughs> don't let them over. Don't let them hornswaggle you. Hornswaggle, I know. Don't let them hornswaggle you. Oh. Let's guess after he's. Oh. <laughs> he's like a part beagle. He's a beagle corgi. Beagle corgi. I thought we were going to have corgis. All right. 229. You should be calling any minute now. He calls two minutes late, so he'll say, You're late. What are you just doing? Just driving along. Uh, uh, is that the Cavalier Pass? No, that's out at uh, Point Reyes. Yeah, okay. That's okay. Right. My wife says, she goes, Bruce, what are you doing holding a camera while you're, oh, while you're driving? Right, yeah, I'm doing this, I'm driving, I'm like this. Well, I was wondering why it was kind of bouncing. Oh, yeah. uh, 
Oh, it's funny, I put it on, on my Facebook page. People love that stuff. <laughs> so I do it every time there's a, a neat drive in the country. I always uh, I film it, yeah. I really like Fred Peterson's... Uh, oh, he's such a crack up, isn't he? Oh, gosh, he's got all these great, uh, you know... It's funny, the one he just posted on Denny McLean, I've got that, that oh, same yeah. clip done. Good old Denny. Denny McLean, Denny McLean, there's never been any like Denny McLean. That, that really is a song, isn't it? Yeah, it is. There we go. Oh my God! Look who just texted me. <laughs> Edward right. Brown here. Uh, I'm trying to reach Bruce McGowan. Yeah, is this Rick? Yeah. Yes, it's Edward Brown and Bruce McGowan. Hey, Rick, how you doing, buddy? Hello, I'm great. Good, good. good. Thank you so much for. Yeah. <laughs> I just got out of the water, so I'm not complaining. I caught some nice waves. Seven out of nine days I've been in the water, Rick. And I'm not going to complain. Oh, that's right on time too. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, we we know you're busy, so we're gonna we're gonna just get right into it. Okay. Great. All right. Thank here you so much. Here we go. Okay. That's right. Nice win last night, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McGowan. Bruce, who's on the phone with us? Well, we got Rick Welts, who's the president of the Golden State Warriors, and Rick is really one of the fast rising executives in the nba uh, started his career as believe it or not a ball boy back in the 1970s with the seattle supersonics rapidly moved up through the ranks became the pr director as a matter of fact i was just telling rick i was just telling uh, edward a story and you won't remember this but when i was 26 or 27 i was working in portland oregon and i came up and co uh, covered a couple of the nba finals when you guys were playing the washington then the, the washington bullets and you were the guy that uh, credentialed me for, uh, for the playoffs. And then the next year, I moved to Seattle, worked for KBR Radio. And your sister, Nancy, was the PR director. You moved up into the higher ranks. But, uh, boy, those were uh, some fun years with the Sonics. I remember Dennis Johnson and Gus Williams and worked with John Johnson on KBR Radio. And we had a great time with Jack Sickman. What a, that must have been a lot of fun. It was incredible. You know, before there was Microsoft or Amazon, uh, it was really the Sonics. Major League Professional Sports team uh, that put Seattle on the map, and uh, you know those were those were some great teams, and some great years. Yeah, I guess the Mariners never. You know, yeah, they had Ken Griffey Jr., but it took, took, a, took them a, it. took them a while to get going, did it? But you guys, and that's to me. I don't want to get off on a tangent about the about the Seattle NBA situation, but Rick, to me, when the Sonics left Seattle, I just thought that was wrong. I don't know how you felt because I, I imagine you felt the same way. Well. I'm just saying that those are nice places, but, uh, but I, I'm not sure our league took a giant step forward. And uh, for those of us who get to travel to those cities, but, but Seattle, uh, Seattle is destined to get another team. The problem we have right now is every team's doing really well on the NBA. We have an appetite for expansion, but uh, I do think that the issue is connected to the NBA brand or league. I hope I mean, so. you got to figure that, you know, Seattle's a large enough market, and you're talking about a, uh, you know, an indoor sport. So, you know, so Seattle's weather, you know, you got to figure that basketball team's got to come back. No, it's, it's, uh, it's a great market for NBA basketball. It's a great market for the sport, but for us, it's, uh, so it's probably not going to be a really objective. But uh, well, the, uh, the Oklahoma City Thunder left behind uh, all, everything really related to the Seattle Sonics. I got to ask you about your your duties now because you're you're running the front office. Now, obviously, um, you're you're not running so much the basketball operations, and you know you're making decisions on who gets traded. But you're helping to negotiate contracts. You're setting up the new arena. I mean, there's a lot of stuff involved in your everyday duties. Can you just kind of give us an overview of what it's like running the front office of an NBA franchise? Well, it's funny. I was showing a, a 14 year old television talk show. Of the 
creation of a special How, how much of this would would you attribute to, let's say, the Warriors' success? I mean, even five years ago, you probably had you know a, a really large staff, but uh, you know the fact that the Warriors are the most uh, entertaining um, uh, and successful a, a successful team around right yeah. now. Uh, you know, how much of it has to actually do with the Warriors per se? Well, I think uh, you know there was a culture of losing. Uh, everybody yeah. uh, prior to Joe Lake and Peter Peter buying the team. Yeah. And that was the basketball team. But also with the front office. Um, now that's not long term. Uh, we're going to see success. We don't see the guy here. Um, you know, there, was a, there was a shift in expectations. Everybody who was here had the opportunity to embrace that, jump on board, and go along for the ride. But it was probably just not for everybody who didn't know what was going to happen. And so part ways, we probably turned over. Incredible gems within the organization who had really been given the opportunity to excel and do a very good job and had to keep this really well in the world. Mm -hmm. So go out and find the best of the best uh, in our industry and even some outside our industry to bring to the Warriors because I was still in the organization that was in expectation to at least win championships. Yeah. Uh, I don't think anyone expected it to happen quite this quickly, but, uh, but we're sure happy. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you mentioned about the losing part because I was watching the game last night and I was thinking, I was literally thinking about this exact question. It's like, if this was, you know, 10 years ago, it would be, okay, how are they going to lose this one? <laughs> you know, and it was really frustrating. It was hard to watch a game knowing that, but, you know, now it's so much fun watching, you know, not, not just the talent, but the fact that... Well, you, you figure know, they're going to win. I mean, yeah, exactly. having lost it, Rick, that kind of blows me away when you think about it. As we speak, now this show will air on the weekend, but... By that time, there would be a couple of games that have been played in the interim. There's the possibility the Warriors could go through the entire home season undefeated. As a matter of fact, going back to last year's middle of the home season, I mean, has what this team has done on the floor kind of boggled your mind sometimes? I, I think there's no one who could have kept us afloat with the success uh, that we've had in the organization since Tom Lee Hill. No team uh, in the NBA has ever gone an entire season without winning the regular season or being in the final round. But heading into the last couple of weeks of the season, we had 15 teams in the NBA that had a season that was similar to the Warriors. The Warriors, who were sitting in that position, and we each happened to play each other at multiple occasions uh, in games over the course of the round of 16. So it's going to be uh, an interesting thing to watch. You know, it kind of reminds me of 98 when uh, uh, both McGuire and Sosa were going for the record. And then you, know, you pick the one year where they both happen to be happen yeah. to do it. So what do you, what do you attribute uh, the success, um, you know, specifically, what are the main factors you think are the success of the Warriors? Well, I don't think there's anyone in the NBA who would argue that the Warriors have the best home court advantage in the NBA in the regular season. So even, you know, while missing the playoffs uh, in 16 out of 17 years, which is almost a mathematical impossibility, <laughs> Yeah, I kind of look at Mark Jackson as that type of guy. It's like, no, 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 we don't lose around here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember when he showed up and, and you guys had the press conference, and I thought, yeah, this guy's saying all the right things, but, I mean, how good is he going to be? He's never had any head coaching experience. And my, my feeling was, as a skeptical a reporter who'd been covering this team for 30, you know, off and on for 30 years, I was thinking, yeah, it was the same old Warriors. But obviously, you're right. I mean, Jackson kind of lit a fire under these guys, and then Steve Kerr takes it to the – to the next level, it's almost like uh, you know you guys had this master plan figured out ahead of time. Yeah, really. I don't know that it was a master plan. I think uh, the Steve Kerr hiring was the end of the game. Yeah, uh, he too was a, a great former player with the Bucks yep. and, 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 and I 
have the pleasure of working side by side with them. President Phoenix on the unit or general manager, and I knew that you were a lucky man. Yeah. Well, you've got a great personality. Yeah. Oh, uh, Rick, Rick, stay with us. Uh, the station's letting me know we have to go to a quick commercial break there. Okay, here's our first commercial break trivia question on sports facts. What is the biggest participant sports in the world? Hmm. All right. That's a good one. Okay, so the first email with the question. Is, is this a team sport or a, it can be uh, a, Just any, anything. Okay. We'll, we'll leave it open. Okay. okay. So what, what is the, the sport, the largest participation of, of people? It can't be recreational, though, can it? Well, it, can, be, it, can be, it can be any, anything sport okay. type related, all right? All right. Uh, let, so, let Rick take a step. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll let him answer when we come back. Okay, <laughs> okay. the first email with the correct answer is going to win a free three-day, two-night stay at the Lighthouse Resort. Uh, stay with us. You're listening to Sports Econ 101. We'll be right back. All right, so that's our first segment with you, and let me go ahead and save the file, and we jump into a few questions. Yeah, how's Nancy doing, by the way, Rick? I haven't uh, spoken to her in years. Well, I haven't seen her since I got up this morning. She happens to be here. I'm oh, that's very great. Very fortunate uh, when I can join her at the ADL. Yeah, I want to talk to you about that. Yeah, so she is a resident of my age here, and started here to help celebrate. That. Sweet, so sweet. Now, now, where is she? Is she still up in Seattle, or? Uh... She was until just a few years ago, and they moved to Indianapolis. Uh, uh -huh. My parents both passed away there. I wasn't even back in Seattle in time. Yeah. Her uh, husband has ten siblings. She lives. Oh my in gosh. The Midwest, so ten siblings. <laughs> wanted her to grow up. And she loved them, so. Wow, one, one of those one of those big Midwestern families. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. All right, guys. Here All we right, go. Here we go. Right into Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Again, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McGowan. Here was our first trivia question. What is the biggest participation sport in the world? You got you an answer on that one, Rick? I'm, I'm stumped. I can't imagine how many of us who grew up playing football or even playing soccer would have any clue. Actually, it's fishing. Fishing? <laughs> I, know, I don't know if I call that a sport, but uh, it is. Okay. So well, that's uh, a trick question. <laughs> Well, that's sort of a trick question. Now we got Rick Welts on the phone, the president of the Warriors. I got to ask you, Rick. Uh, you, you you referred to Steve Kerr and the in the move to bring him aboard. I know that was a very tough decision to have to cut uh, ties with Mark Jackson. It was kind of unpopular with a lot of fans in the media because they thought, "Oh my God, what are they doing? This guy got the team into the playoffs." But you really kind of lucked into falling, having Steve Kerr fall on your lap, and, and that whole uh, process of getting him aboard was not an easy one. I know that. Bob Myers always talks about it as it's, it's almost serendipity. Everything just fell in, into place. Can you tell us how that, that whole sequence of events happened? Well, we were in the playoffs and uh, obviously had a coach in Phil Kennedy and Mark Jackson were hanging with uh, some coach in Tampa, Steve Martin at the time. And uh, Phil Jackson had been hired to go look for that team that had the team that was going to be the coach. And he uh, just was an interest in negotiating with Steve, and I think he really kind of a Uh, then our season ended, and we did have an opportunity to see if we were going to make a move. We were interviewing a couple of other coaches, and during one of those interviews, uh, we actually got a text from Steve saying, hey, I think you should keep talking to him. And I actually did have a meeting with him later. And he came in with a binder that pretty much knew the whole Steve Kerr and the whole plot and idea as to how he was going to play the team, the systems he would play, the At that point, uh, we made our decision. Fortunately, uh, we're in the same position. Well, it wasn't easy though, because I know that when you when you did bring him in, uh, there was some skepticism among the players themselves. They really liked Mark Jackson, but it, it sounds like uh, Steve Kerr just won them over so quickly, and now he's he's even more popular than Jackson among the players. I don't think you can have anybody can turn my around to Steve Kerr and not come away and say, "Wow, I like him. He's my guy." He's my guy. Yeah. Well, he seems like he's always smiling. You know, like he, he's a he's a, he's a, po he's a positive he's a person, which yeah. which counts for a lot, doesn't it, Rick? He is, and he, he's got a remarkable personal story. And he won five NBA championships uh, by playing with Andrew Wood and the Bulls, and then winning with the Rockets and the Spurs. But uh, he learned from the best coaches, and then he's a winner his whole life. And he's just he's just happy to be here. I know, uh, be at the center of the organization. So how how much of let's say uh, Curry's humility? 
uh, is, is contributing to the success? You know, because it seems like it's a very unselfish team. I think what people observe, I think it's hard to watch our team and not see kind of a potential of good transition or good connection to the people who go on the court or on the bench. That is a really uh, perspective that I think people can sense and can look at. Uh, and I think they, the success of the team is very uh, up to the flow as basketball players are good at having a team. I think that's maybe the most important thing about the town. That's yeah. Um, for a lot of it. Yep. Uh, I don't. I don't think he's somebody that you can ever look at and say, "Boy, I would never have that choice if I was a college kid." Nice guy. Keeps all the rules in place. So it's a perfect coach. Rick Wilts is joining us. He's the president of the Golden State Warriors, the defending NBA champions, the best team in the NBA record-wise as we speak. And Rick, uh, an interesting thing is happening to the Warriors that people outside of the Bay Area may not be aware of. Of course, the Warriors franchise started in San Francisco, played most of the first 10 years as a franchise in San Francisco, moved to Oakland, but now you're going to move back over to the west side of the Bay, and what's the latest on the uh, construction of a new downtown, I guess it's going to be along the waterfront, just south of the Giants ballpark uh, arena, and when when do you anticipate the, the club moving to San Francisco? Well, we're expecting uh, that to happen in, for the 2019 NBA season. We have a small acre site in the Bay. Cleared uh, a lot of work over the last two and a half years. All regulatory hurdles and water, water balance had to be recertified. Uh, we have one lot. We have a project that we have to install some state action signs. So we also have legislative uh, directions in the courts uh, uh, that have directed courts to uh, do what we did in the initial case, which is to appeal within nine months. And we're about three months into that. So our hope is that this time next year we have shovel in the ground and uh, complete the project about two and a half months later. And it's not only a new 18,000 seat arena, but it's also a new office tower. It's 120,000 square feet of local restaurant retail, uh, thousand delivery parking places, a block of homes on each side of the street plaza, and it triggers the construction of a new five and a half acre park. Wow. I don't think 18,000 seats is going to be enough. <laughs> yeah, no, it's even smaller. Uh, yeah. It's perfect. It's designed to be smaller than the current uh, Oracle Arena is. It's right now trying to serve every town and golf course in the state. So the atmosphere that we have is perfect. What's, what's great, I think, about what's happened to the Warriors, Rick, as, as a person who grew up here in the Bay Area, as an observer of this franchise and the history of this franchise, is that this team has really as good as the San Francisco Giants have been, and give them credit, they've won three World Series championships. But the Warriors have really, I always felt if they won a championship, the whole Bay Area was going to celebrate because they're the one team that everybody can feel that is a part of their community. They represent the Bay Area. Well, that's the thing. So you have two teams in football, two teams in baseball. And the hockey team is, as good as the hockey that's team is in that. terms of unifying, they're in the South Bay, and hockey is just not a, it's it's still popular, but it's not, it doesn't have the kind of widespread well, appeal. It's, it's not a West Coast yeah, type of sport. no, it isn't. And, and so, with that in mind, yeah. Rick, your 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 ball club has just, I have, you know, you walk around town and just talk to people on the street who are not really basketball fans, yeah. and they're talking about Steph Curry, they're talking about Draymond. That must be a wonderful thing as somebody who works in the front office to be a part of a franchise. It's the hottest thing, you know, since sliced bread. Well, it is a completely different experience. You know, and I. Are you going to bring the entire staff, uh, uh, you know, all the all the vendors and everybody over to the new stadium? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's interesting. Actually, it's interesting you say that. We've entered into a lot of agreements uh, on the way to uh, doing this project in Los Angeles. Uh, the, the labor agreement we have with local Al uh, to build Oracle Arena if they so choose to do that in San Francisco. Uh, the Oracle Arena is 
No, that's great. Hey, I gotta uh, tell our listeners, Rick is being honored at a special banquet this week, and I know that it's a it's a big uh, you know plus for you and something you're very proud of. Tell us a little bit about that. What's that event all about? Uh, well, thank you. It's uh, it's very humbling. It's uh, the anti defamation league. Uh, the country is the leading organization for defamation, uh, where uh, their peers. And Well, it's it's certainly nice to be able to celebrate not only championships but uh, you know well deserved recognition. And I know that you know working in the NBA all these years, uh, Rick, and we're talking with Rick Wells of the Warriors, the team president, that you you watch this league develop and go through a lot of changes. And right now, it just seems like we talked about Stephen Curry and, and Clay Thompson and the whole joyful vibe that this club has. It's palpable on the on the court and it almost really has transformed the game in some respects and that a lot of youngsters are looking at this and they're thinking maybe this is the way to play basketball the way that you know you and I and Edward who are older remember basketball being played when we were kids. Yeah, I get chills when you say that. Uh, the story today was saying just that. One of the more remarkable things about the series of three things happening in the league between 1999 and 2015, which is incredibly disciplined uh, series of all three games and shooting below 50 left feet, uh, which you, for any other player, is done all by themselves in the arena before the game starts and now have to out field goal. Well, you know what's great is, is that it's, it's, it's turned it back into a family event. You know, just the whole basketball thing. It's not so much the bad boys, you know, the Detroit Pistons of the 80s and 90s, you know, that sort of thing. Well, I think all of us, whoever played in the Hey, uh, Rick, stay with us one last minute. We're just going to uh, go cut to a break, and then we'll have you on for a little bit longer, and then we'll say goodbye. Okay, so here's our second trivia question. What are the three biggest sporting events commanded by television audiences? Mm. All right? Okay. You can get them in order. You get an extra special oh, bonus. Okay. All right? Stay with us. You're listening to Sports Econ 101. We'll be right back. All right. All right. Let me save this file. You're not here. going back to Utah, I can take it, Rick. I am not. <laughs> Uh, well, it's not going to be a tough game tonight. You no, know. It's, a, it's a game they need to win. Yeah. And, uh, we, they, they have an incredibly difficult place to play as well. Yeah. That's, well, that, that's one of the things I wanted to ask you on the air, if I could, is about you know maybe the season being too long, you know, guys getting gassed and that sort of thing. Um, you know, like your opinion about that. Like I was talking to someone and they said even the fans were getting a little bit, but I'm thinking, eh, well, you're selling out all the time, so the fans, are, you know, they're still obviously into it, but. Um, We appreciate you spending all this time with us, too. Yeah, thanks for the, yeah. for the time, Rick. It's great to have you on. All right. All right. <clears throat> all right. And away we go. Well, welcome back to Sports Econ 101. One more time. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McGowan. Here was our second trivia question. What are the three biggest sporting events commanded by television audiences? And unfortunately, I can't say the Warriors are in this one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say, well, I don't know about... What, what do you think, Rick? I imagine Super Bowl is number one. Uh, no. No? Oh, I guess World Cup. Oh, World, well, from, yes. Yeah, okay, World uh, Cup. Okay, okay. So, I, I'm thinking of the United States. Okay, World Cup but, was number two. What was number one? Summer Olympics. Oh, Summer Olympics. And the last one? 
World Series? No. Formula One racing. You're kidding me. Yeah, but this is for the world. Yeah, well, it says commanded by television audiences, so yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's all around yeah. the world. That's a trick question again, Edward. <laughs> <laughs> he does this to me all the time, right? He <laughs> tricks me with these questions. Well, i got, I got to keep Bruce interested yeah. here. Okay, so we have Rick Waltz from the, uh, from the Warriors, the Warriors on, the, yes. uh, on the air. Team president. And, team president, yes. And uh, one of the th questions I wanted to ask you is, do you think the season is too long? And the reason I'm asking that is that, you know, with all the traveling going on all the time and, and coast to coast and all that, uh, it seems like these players are, are just, sometimes they're just exhausted. Well, it's, uh, you know, I guess it's the eye of the beholder. Uh, I don't know that it's eight months from the start of spring practice. It's shorter. Uh, you know, it's kind of week, week to week. Uh, the uh, length of the All-Star break was uh, never less. Now about a month long three days too short and that's just not the season mm -hmm. and the days on uh, result of shorter uh, season what those ideas uh, one thing that I'm going to do a lot better I, I, you know you sort of went to our players uh, last week and finally addressed And I gotta say, from a fan standpoint too, you know, we want to see good basketball. You know, we want to see high percentage shots, and and it's kind of sad when you see some of these guys. You're just you just know that they need a break, and yet they're they're kind of constantly playing. Yeah, that's like you said on our team. Like, you know, we don't have any player that's you know, thirty five percent shooting. Yeah. A very good running shooting out of him. True, but that's because the, you're so deep. Now that's the advantage. I think that's one of the reasons. And now again, we talk about the Warriors revolutionizing the game. You have teams. A lot of teams only have maybe three guys that they depend on coming off the bench. The Warriors use five, six, sometimes seven guys. So, you, Rick, it really is the team uh, sport in the purest sense of the word. You're, the way your club uh, approaches it. Plus, he's had some injuries. Yeah. You know, Steve Kerr came in and uh, you know, he just pulled it out of the locker room. Time in Chicago at the time, and you know, some of the best that he did was to have such a player on the roster, have a chance to contribute and be able to contribute. And when you do have that, and you sort of do have a team that can be playing with four, six, seven star players. Yeah, before we let you go, I got to ask you about the corporate sponsorship and the relationship you have to have in the community with some of the, the big sponsors. And I don't know if fans realize how important that is. Not only from a revenue generating standpoint, but just to, to kind of bring in the sort of sponsors that are going to you know represent your uh, culture and your company and, and that you feel comfortable with, and that's a big part of what you do, I would think, isn't it? It is. It's, it's a big part of how people uh, friends on the team, the company of people that are working for the team, also the ability to kind of magnify. Well, it's interesting, you know, when, when we, when we, you know, as a fan watching TV and watching Comcast Sports, a lot of times, you know, there's commercials with you on um, with City National Bank, and you know, a lot of people don't even know about City National. Small, or, no, it's small. actually uh, one of my our favorite sponsors, and their relationship with City National Bank is just as good or just as uh, nothing as uh, uh, Chase's something with us. Well, they're they're amazing. <laughs> hey, hey, I gotta ask you, Rick. You know, you started off in about as humble a, a position as anybody could. You, you were just a kid. 
I believe in high school as a ball boy with the Seattle Supersonics. Did you envision in the back of your mind when you were doing this, hey, I'd kind of like to make a career out of working in the NBA somehow, some way? Sure, he had the confidence. In <laughs> he knew he could do the job. But, but I mean, I mean were well, you? I had a couple of seconds left. Yeah. I, mean, I really, I think, I think the last line to every introduction that you see involved in this all time had to be on a ball boy. But to tell you the truth, the very few people who get to do what I get to do every day, whoever had the experience uh, of being a fly on the wall in the NBA locker room and seeing the interaction between the media and the owners and the team and staff, see how those dynamics affect uh, a team mm. for bad. Mm -hmm. I really uh, rely a lot on the team to be bad or to be more fit. Um, what I, I think the other thing, you know, the Sonics were the first NBA franchise, our first professional franchise in Seattle. My dad and I uh, kind of bonded through our, our sports fascination. He would take me to games with him. Even in those very early years with the Sonics, there was something going on there that I never could imagine in any shape or form that I could be in the city with him and see him every day. You don't find that in any other aspect of our life in the world where we become sort of an uncomfortable club player, shared interests. You know, it's interesting, too, talking about your Seattle experience, and I had a chance, as I mentioned, to, to work in Seattle uh, for about a year and cover the team right after they won the championship. And for those that don't remember this, and this is going back a few years, the Sox, for a couple of years, played their games in the Kingdom, which could seat up to 40,000 people for a, a basketball game. And, in fact, you did get 40,000 fans once in a while for NBA games. That's incredible. Yeah, that, that, uh, that record still stands, uh, season record. That'll be my next trivia question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah, that must have been fun, though, to be a part of that. I mean, the whole city was really behind the Sonics, literally, figuratively, and in every sense of the word. Yeah, they called it the sixth man. Yeah. The 11th, you know, the 12th man. Uh, yeah. the, uh, what was that like, though, being, in a, being a part of an organization where you had that much? I mean, it's very similar, I guess, to the Warriors situation here, and that, that the communities, all the communities in the Bay Area, have sort of taken you in as one of their own. Yeah, that, that it was a, uh, it was a, a difference from once in a while. I don't know that first year that we went to the NBA Finals and we lost in the Western Field. Um, we started that, Bill Russell had been our coach the year before, Bill was fired and we brought in, this is a trivia, trivia question too, this is Mitch Ashton, Bill Russell, cousin by the name of Bob Hopkins, and the first 22 games of the NBA season under Bob Hopkins was the worst record in the NBA, it was 5-7. Wow. And, uh, Bob was fired. That's amazing. That is amazing. Next year, it came back and, uh, and won the championship also. So, so those, were, those were a couple of really interesting moments. So I, feel, I feel sad, though, when I think about those teams because John Johnson, who was an outstanding player on those teams, died recently. Dennis Johnson is no longer around. It just makes you realize how, how the fragility of life, uh, you know, and, and, and you forge these relationships with these players. You get to know them over the years. You work with them. And then they, you know, they move on to other fields, and then, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, they die, and it just sort of brings it all back to life, how, how much of a people business this truly is. It is, and those teams, when they have that kind of success, they stay in touch. I talked to, you know, this, just this week, I talked to Fred Brown last week, I talked to Jeff Green from Golden Spurs on that, and Tom Green from the Kings on that. Um, so it's, uh, you know, if you accomplish great things, Well, Rick, it's been such a pleasure having you on. I want to congratulate you and the Warriors on, on a great season. We hope that, uh, that you have an encore and, and win it all this year. I guess, uh, you know, the next month and a half is going to be some, some exciting times for everybody. Let's listen, I'm already saying three P. <laughs> oh <my laughs> no pressure. <laughs> yeah. Great to, great to have you with us, Rick. Appreciate your, your checking in, and uh, we'll, we'll do this again sometime. Thank you so much, Rick, for joining us. That, that's Rick Wilts, the president of the Golden State Warriors. Good guy, and again, uh, you know, it's kind of an interesting story. We, we talked about it before, uh, Edward, about how this guy started his career as a ball boy. And you, you talk about the, 
Horatio Alger's story, you know, rags to riches. I mean, now he's the president of arguably the uh, one of the greatest teams in the history of the NBA, which is a great story. Well, it's amazing. How I, what I thought was really interesting is the fact that he uh, specifically talked about his experiences as being 15 to 16, 17-year-old kid, but seeing so much in the locker room that he gleaned from that. And yeah. that's probably a big reason why he was able to achieve what he achieved being president now. It's so much fun, though, thinking about that team that he got to be a part of, and he was later... PR director of and the team that I covered, the first NBA team that I really got to cover closely was the Seattle Supersonics the year they won the championship and the year after they won the championship. And when you're around a team that has that kind of success, Edward, and you're around them every day, you're at practice, you're watching the games uh, in person, and you're getting to know the players, there really is a, a very special connection. And, and the, I think fans who follow the Warriors or who follow any team that's successful appreciate that and realize they don't take it for granted because, you know, championship seasons don't happen that often. Yeah, I think one of the things I really appreciate, <laughs> it's kind of funny because I think Steve Kerr kind of gave, he did a little bit of a laugh, uh, you know, on the sideline was there sometimes they pass too much. It, sometimes it's too oh, much yeah. unselfish. Oh, the other day Steph Curry made, you know, he tried to do a behind the back between yeah. the legs pass and it was like, what are you doing? You know, yeah. he threw the ball away. But he was, it was almost like he was trying to outdo himself. And then, then they, uh, you know, you never see Curry Stuff the ball because he's six yeah. three. He doesn't really need to do that on a breakaway. He, he was upset because he had missed an easy shot on the previous uh, possession, so he went over a six foot six inch swing man and stuffed it. And I've never heard such a noise yeah. uh, from a crowd. If I remember correctly, the play before he he the shot he missed, he got fouled. He got yeah, oh that's head. right, he got hit and, in the hand. And yeah. Didn't get uh, didn't, didn't get, get called. called. No, it's just pretty rare. What, what the thing I think is that I really appreciate is his demeanor. That even if uh, ref misses a call. Uh, you know, he just kind of smiles and he shows just Shrugs a little off. time. Yeah, just a little frustration. Draymond Green a little different. Draymond <laughs> is more of the emotional guy. He'll get a technical once in a while. Draymond is a very... I think Draymond Green is the sort of the straw that stirs the Warriors' drink, though. He's the guy that, that lights a fire on them. And Steph Curry is the kind of the calming influence whenever they need that big shot, whenever they need somebody to sort of quiet the team down on the floor and just calm them down, they meant with Steph yeah. Curry. But I, I look... The thing I love about Iguodala, which he hasn't played for quite a while now because of his injury, but uh, is that he he see, he's just a very honest person. So that if he commits a foul and he gets called for it, that's it, no big deal. But if he really knows that he didn't commit a foul, it'll be kind of the the, the, the hands going up like what? <laughs> no, no, no! It's not a foul. Can we handle? Yeah. Can not do that? How can you call a foul on me? How dare you call <laughs> yeah. a foul on me? Don't worry, I'll call him on myself if yeah. I foul. Yeah, exactly. Okay, we're gonna cut to our last commercial break here. Trivia question: uh, Theme is on sports facts. We had two odd ones. So oh, what, here's yeah. our third one. In 2012, the winner of the of the nation the Nathan's famous hot dog eating contest was Joey Chestnut, right. and he ate 68 hot dogs. Jeez. In the first competition in 1984, the winner ate. How many hot dogs? Okay. Okay. And I'm going to see if you can guess within 10. Okay. Okay. Because I'm trying to get the exact amount is going to be pretty tough. Sure. Right? Stay with us. You're listening to Sports Econ 101. That's a sport? Yeah, sure. Hot dog eating. <laughs> you bet. When we come back, we're going to have some closing comments on Sports Econ 101. Don't touch that dial. <laughs> I got to know Joey Chestnut a lot. Oh, did you really? Character, yeah. I, I just don't see how. Oh, man. I just get mm, thinking yeah, about how they could. It's disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> it, it really is. is. Very unhealthy, too. Oh, oh, I can Extremely only imagine. Yeah. Imagine what that does to your, to your system. Just, yeah, especially hot dogs. It's not like you're eating It's broccoli. funny. You see Joey's chest, but he looks like a normal guy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I can't, I can't think his system is normal. Yeah. Look at you eating your fruit. Good, good man. Yeah, but do you notice it's there? It's not here. Oh, you'll eat it. <laughs> yeah, it'll, be, it'll be yeah. in your tummy by the end of the day. <laughs> it will be. The, uh, it's funny. I can imagine after Joey... You know, finishes the contest, and it's like, okay, well, how are you going to celebrate? Go to Disneyland? He goes, yeah, I think I'm going to go out for some hot dogs. <laughs> I think I'm going to go puke. Yeah. But I was thinking, you know, right after I that little video I shot of Gus getting the thing, yeah. we're about maybe 20 yards down the street, you know, he must have eaten something before that, and he, he just goes, <laughs> and it's a huge pile of hot dogs in my hand, just right there in the middle of the sidewalk. And, and, and I didn't have anything to pick it up with. Did you film it? No, and I had nothing to pick it up with, so I just uh, left it there. Pile of Ubers. dog, of dog uh, varmint, vomit. Varmint. <laughs> dog varmint. Yeah. This is all getting on the, the, uh, That's true. the, the webcast. It, I like it. It, it is. There we go. <laughs> That's why we're very careful not to yeah. swear. That's right. Okay. You know, we're such well mannered people. Yes, we are. All right, here we go. 
Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Last time for today, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McGowan. Last trivia question. In 2012, the winner of the Nathan's Famous Hot Dog Eating Contest. Which happens in Brooklyn, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, or Coney Island. Coney Island. Coney Island. Go, yeah. It was Joey Chestnut. And he ate 68 hot dogs. Mm -hmm. Now, the first competition was 1984. The winner ate how many hot dogs? 42. You ready for this? Yeah. Nine and a half. Nine and a half? <laughs> How can you win with only nine and a half? You and I can win. <laughs> I know. You and I can eat more than nine and a half. Uh, well, they, they must have been giant hot dogs, huh? Uh, no, they're, apparently they were the same. Nine and a half? Maybe there's only one guy. Seriously? <laughs> he this after nine and a half. He goes, oh he goes listen, I'm going to win anyway. I'm done. Jeez. <laughs> I, I, thought that was a I thought that was a really interesting Wow. Show. That's yeah. a big difference between 9 and 68. That is a big difference. And yeah, you were saying that Joey Chestnut, he looks like a normal guy. Normal guy, guy yeah. Yeah, he does. He's just an average sized guy. I don't know how he does it, but he does it. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, Rick Wells, that was great uh, having him on. Yeah, an interesting Insight. guy. Interesting guy. Some, you know, as I said, uh, a lot of responsibility running the front office of, of any sports franchise. But when you've got a team that's, uh, in, you know, front and center at the top of the league and defending championship, uh, boy, that's got to be a lot of fun. Oh, uh, uh, I pay to have this job. Yeah. Okay, here's our closing uh, thoughts for the day here. In July 1934, Babe Ruth paid a fan $20 for the return of the baseball he hit for his 700th career home run. Cool, I like see, that. See, even back then, yeah. home run balls were extra yeah, valuable. Yeah, of course right? they were. Yeah. And racehorses have been known to wear out shoes in one race. Wow. That's a, that, that, one race? That's Yeah. I, I, wow. Wow. I don't understand how that. I don't know. I, I, I can't, don't I they can't. wear regular metal? Yeah. No, you shoes? got me. I can't figure that one out. I don't get it either. Okay, so tune in next week to Sports Econ 101. We're going to be discussing sports topics from a business perspective, giving away more free vacations for answering sports trivia questions. Thanks for listening. On behalf of our team, I'm your host Edward Brown, and we'll see you next week. Good night, America. So long. All right, that's, that's right. a take. That's a take. That's a next, week, next week, we're going to do two shows. Yes. And on Wednesday, right? On Wednesday, Wednesday? No, on Tuesday. On Tuesday. Tuesday the 5th. Tuesday the 5th. Because I have hand surgery on They're going to have hand surgery on the 6th, right? Yeah. All right, Edward. We'll have All to right. two shows out of the way there. Yes.